I grew up loving stories, particularly movies and books, and especially the genres of fantasy and science fiction. I was infatuated by the power of the imagination, and I was delighted by how authors and filmmakers could seemingly create entire alternative worlds. In fact, I loved it so much that I myself began writing stories. As a young budding writer, it was my favorite thing to write. The, the uh, idea of an imaginary world often seemed more compelling and more engaging to me than the real world. In recent years, however, I started to think more critically about this love for fiction, uh, which it seems to me is shared to varying degrees by the vast majority of the culture. I started to ask questions like, if I love a fictional world more than I love the real world, isn't that kind of an insult to God who created the real world? Aren't I showing in doing that, that uh, I love a human creator's work more than I love the original creator's work? And shouldn't I love his creation more? Uh, also, I started to consider whether it could even be harmful to have to grow up with these fictional stories rattling around in my head and being so dear to me. I think, and uh, I think it's probably true for a lot of people, that um, it it made it difficult to appreciate some things in the real world. For example, I liked the idea of being uh, interested in other cultures, but uh, to take the time to learn about them seemed bland to me. I would rather learn about a fictional fantasy world uh, packaged in a digestible story form with uh, heroes and villains and otherworldly powers and high stakes. And in addition to dulling my interest in the real world, uh, this love for fiction was, I believe, a significant factor in what you could call my mental health problems. Now, maybe mental health problems is a little strong, but what I mean is that I think this love for fiction had a negative impact on my psychological and emotional well-being. Here's what I mean. My life was not dramatic, and it was relatively conflict-free, but I loved the drama of fiction. Internally, I became overly dramatic about things that I should have been practical and sober-minded about. In hindsight, it, it seems to me like my subconscious was saying, if I respond in this way, maybe I can have a little bit of that drama and conflict that I see in stories. Now, I think this was subconscious because consciously, I despised real life drama and I avoided conflict like the plague, which was surely also part of the problem. But this internal drama this kind of love of misery caused me no small distress as I entered into adulthood, especially in relationships. I would get caught in this, um, this mental cycle, this vicious circle of thinking where I would start feeling distressed. Then I would pacify those feelings of distress. Then I would check to make sure I wasn't really still feeling distressed. And then I would start feeling distressed again. There was some variation to the content of the thoughts, but it was always as if my, my mind or my brain had kind of slipped a groove to go back to feeling miserable. And I, I seriously started wondering if I had obsessive compulsive disorder, because that kind of checking and rechecking is something that's associated with that disorder. Now, a decade into adulthood and happily married for the better part of that decade, those psychological and emotional difficulties are, thank God, behind me. Um, if I had some kind of OCD, I don't have it now. And one of the things that, that helped me, one of the key factors that helped me in overcoming that cycle of mental distress was changing what I consumed. At first, I, I basically detoxed from fiction and I started delving into learning about real world things like politics. Even if, I, if, even if I, uh, it wasn't interesting to me at first, 
I would start uh, investigating questions to things that I had never learned before, like uh, how do they make popcorn? Which, if you're wondering, they don't make popcorn. Eventually, my interest in real things expanded. I fanned the flames of curiosity, and the new information in my brain helped, I believe, to throw the switch of my mental railroad so that my train of thoughts could escape the endless cycle. Nowadays, I do partake sometimes in fiction, uh, a film or a book or some other medium. Uh, but even as I do, I wrestle with some questions. What does a healthy relationship with fiction look like? And now as a new father, what does that healthy relationship with fiction look like for my child? Real quick, I want to let you know that I offer content writing and copy editing services, especially but not exclusively for Christian ministries and publications. So if you need written content, an article, a web page, a feature story, a video script, or anything else, I'd love to create that content. Or if you've already got something written and you need a second pair of eyes on it, I've got that second pair of eyes right here. From proofreading to copy editing, I'll help you realize the best version of your project. Whether it's a blog post or an interview, a review, a book, uh, even a speech, whatever it may be. So if you uh, want to get an idea of my ability and voice, head over to anthonylanger.com and check out the blog. Or if you are ready to talk about what we can create together, or you've simply got a question, shoot me an email at contact at anthonylanger.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Often, fiction is intended purely, or at least primarily, as entertainment. And it's often enjoyed as an escape from daily life. Presumably, people who want to escape from their daily life uh, do that because their life is humdrum or outright miserable or simply stressful in a normal kind of way as fulfilling your regular responsibilities can sometimes be. But let's think about this Christianly. In either of those cases, any of those cases, a humdrum life, a miserable life, or a stressful life, shouldn't the resolution be to find your peace and joy in God? If you look for those things, peace and joy, elsewhere, aren't you putting your hope and your faith in some other false savior? looking for something else to deliver you from your difficulties? Isn't that idolatry? Now, maybe there's some argument to be made that escape is not all bad. Uh, someone might argue that it's actually one of the means that God uses to help us decompress and return to our responsibilities and difficulties feeling refreshed and with a new perspective. But if that argument is to be, is to be made, I would really like to see the biblical support for it. In defense of escapism, C.S. Lewis one time relayed a question that was put to him by J.R.R. Tolkien. What class of men would you expect to be most preoccupied with and hostile to the idea of escape? And the answer that Tolkien gave was jailers. Okay, so it's a punchy point, right? But of course, it's an equivocation, right? Because escape from jail is not the same thing as escape from reality. Tolkien's and Lewis's point, or their implication, seems to be that some people's lives, some people's realities may be as miserable or as terrible as jail. So why would you bemoan them wanting relief from that? But for that to hold any water in the Christian life, you would have to explain why fiction and not prayer, reading the scripture, fellowship in the community of faith is the better refuge from life's difficulties and responsibilities. I think you'd be hard pressed to find biblical footing for such an argument. 
The anti-escapist, on the other hand, uh, can present p such passages as 1 Peter 5, verses 7 and 8, where it says that, God, that you should cast all your anxieties on him, on God, because he cares for you, and you should be sober-minded and watchful. Of course, people may also consume fiction for reasons that do not entail escape, attempting to keep at least one foot in the real world while they consume it. But that's not always so easy. Uh, fiction is often immersive, and I think we've kind of been programmed to be immersed by it, or let ourselves be immersed in it, such that a person who is not intending to escape may find by the end of it he had escaped. He had for a brief time kind of lost himself in it and um, instead of merely consuming the content he himself had been consumed by it. In fact it's not uncommon for storytellers, authors, and filmmakers to be told that they should craft their story in such a way that the audience forgets that they are reading a book or watching a movie. That's kind of the ideal of storytelling. But as Christians, we should ask, is it ever appropriate to lose ourselves? Is it good to voluntarily forget who we are, namely who we are in Christ, even for a moment? And is that not indeed what happens to some extent when we immerse ourselves in a fictional world, especially a world where Christ is not presumed to be Lord. It's undeniable that humans are story-oriented beings, and it's pretty much undeniable that God is too. First, because he created us in his image, so if we are, then he is, but also because much of his special revelation to us in the Bible comes to us in story form. Of course, also, just the way that life is. You know, like, you're put into this world, there's a beginning of your life and an end of, end of your life. There's things that happen in between. That's a story. The way that history works, it began in the beginning, and it's moving towards the end. All of that in between is a story. Jesus Christ himself came into this story, and, uh, and then lived his life, died, and was resurrected. This, all of it is story. So, um, yeah, we are story-oriented. All of life is story-oriented. God himself relates to us in this way through story. But think of this. All of those stories, or that you could say that one big story, is not fiction. It's history. It's non-fiction. So I wonder if a lot of the benefits, the supposed benefits of fiction, could also be gained through non-fiction, through reading history, or hearing the life stories of loved ones, or keeping track of current events. All of that is story as well. And all of those activities have certain benefits that fiction does not. Now, I want to be clear that I haven't figured out all of the answers to the questions that I'm asking. Um, th this is not me trying to present some kind of definitive, conclusive theory about fiction and nonfiction. I'm really asking questions, and I think these questions need to be asked, and I don't think Christians talk about these things enough. I've heard a lot over the years uh, in terms of people opining about what content, specific fictional content that Christians should or should not um, engage in or should, should or should not consume. But I haven't heard much by way of uh, an overarching, robust Christian philosophy of fiction. And that's what I think we need. And that's what these questions that I'm asking are trying to get to. Now, I think that the, the answers to these questions are going to be pretty nuanced. And I don't think, despite the impression I may have given so far by my line of questioning, I don't think that uh, the conclusion is going to be to shun all fiction. 
I, I think that's actually an impossible conclusion to draw because we have in the Bible divine precedent uh, for fiction in parables. Um, so you could not say that all fiction is bad. Um, but we do have to navigate fiction wisely. And here's the bottom line. We cannot love fiction more than reality. Um, because for the Christian, reality is far, far better than fiction could ever be. Um, we have in the gospel story a true story that is far better than any fictional story could ever be. I mean, the, the gospel story is the story of our redemption and our restoration to God through Jesus Christ. It impacts everything about life. It impacts the whole world, and it's real. So if, if we are more captivated and more delighted by any other story, that's a problem. So how can parents help direct their children to have a healthy relationship with fiction? Specifically, because this is the only hard and fast principle I've derived so far out of all of this, Specifically, how can parents help their children not to love fiction more than reality? I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that if a child grows up engaged in nonfiction the way that I grew up engaged in fiction, then he will be more likely to love God's world and God's story uh, like I loved imaginative worlds and imaginative stories. And he will be better equipped to uh, understand and be successful in the world where he actually lives and in the story of which he is actually a part. So what would it look like to be engaged in nonfiction? First, when the child's very young, I envision it as telling that child exclusively Bible stories and historical anecdotes rather than fairy tales and made-up children's stories. And that can be aided by um, picture books or other creative visuals that portray those historical events. Then, as the child uh, grows up a little bit and is able to read for himself, mom and dad supply him with books about historical events and, and historical figures and about real-world topics. And in both of these stages, I would limit or uh, completely eliminate uh, screen time. Uh, so TV, um, uh, online video, video games, anything like that, which doctors say is not, uh, is not very good for ch child development anyway, uh, but for our purposes would eliminate a whole swath of uh, fiction uh, and, keep, and help keep the child grounded and rooted in the real world. Now, um, I don't want to be uh, like overly dogmatic about this. I don't want to be um, unrealistic about this. So, for example, if I'm if I'm playing with my child and I'm pretending that the toy rhinoceros is speaking in English to the toy bear, uh, I could be rightly accused of engaging in fiction, right? Because real rhinoceroses and real bears don't socialize, much less in human language. And if you want to go one step deeper, uh, because these pieces, pieces of plastic are not really the animals that they represent, okay? Okay. If someone wants to accuse me of that, that's fine. Uh, uh, and and uh, point taken. Um, that's not the end of the world, right? And, and my point is not to... Um, is not to uh, hide the fact that fiction exists from my child, right? Or to hide the fact that anthropomorphism is a thing, right? If I were to try to uh, hide that from my child, then I would actually be working against my purpose in all of this, which is to uh, help him understand the real world. Because in the real world, fiction does exist. And in the real world, anthropomorphism is pervasive, uh, if not inevitable, 
right? So uh, I'm not going, I'm not trying to go completely overboard with this, but notice that the toys are toy animals, uh, animals that really exist. They're not like uh, superhero action figures or, or some of their toys of some other fictional characters. And that's intentional because I am trying to uh, keep my child from being endeared to those fictional stories at this very young age. I'd rather ground him in reality so that when he does interact with fiction, he does so with understanding and critical thinking, with his mind ahead of his heart. And in all of these considerations, I hope you can see the, the problem is not so much fiction itself, but the love of fiction. Mainly, I want my child to love, uh, to not love fiction as much as uh, nonfiction, to not be involved with fiction as much as he's involved with nonfiction. And um, this does not mean discouraging or disrupting his imaginative play. Uh, but I do want to closely keep an eye on that imaginative play because it might be a good indicator for uh, what he's being most influenced by. And those influences are exactly what I'm trying to carefully curate. Now, as the child moves toward and into adolescence, uh, exposure to fiction can broaden incrementally, especially with an emphasis on analyzing that fiction rather than becoming a fan of it. And ideally, this would be more classic literature rather than popular contemporary media. Also, screen time can become more flexible uh, according to the child's level of maturity and self-control, um, but again, always with an emphasis and a view towards analysis rather than fandom. Um, and always, critical consumption of history, science, arts, and current events will be emphasized and encouraged over mindless consumption of commercial or popular fiction. And the hope is that by the time the child is an adult, he will be, Lord willing, grounded in a robust understanding of the world that he lives in, both past and present, and he will be equipped with an arsenal of, arsenal of knowledge and skills that um, allow him to make his way in the world. And he'll probably be steps ahead of his peers, uh, beset as they may be with expertise in imaginary things and relative ignorance in real things. And when my adult child does interact with fiction, he will have a foundation to not be swept up in it, but to think about it critically. And when it's good, to enjoy it to an appropriate degree. Um, he will uh, have a high standard for entertainment. And uh, his interest in being entertained will be measured and under control, not like uh, an addict looking for his next fix. Now over to you. What are your thoughts on all of this? As I said, I'm still working through these ideas. Um, I've begun reading some of the related literature. Uh, Lewis, Tolkien, and G.K. Chesterton all have essays related to this topic. Uh, so I may interact with some of their thoughts in future videos and future articles on my website. So make sure to subscribe on YouTube and also head over to anthonylanger.com and subscribe there to make sure you don't miss those. But in the meantime, um, if you will, please like this video. Uh, but more, import more importantly, uh, please leave a comment below to let me know what you think. I would really like to have some feedback on these thoughts as I'm still working through all of it. Uh, until next time, I'm Anthony Langer. Thank you for listening. <laughs>